trusting someone with your precious child can be very difficult. Will harm come to them? Will they be treated right? Will they become an urban legend when something goes horribly wrong? Or are you just overreacting? We will find out soon enough. Number 1 I have been babysitting since I was 13. I've had more than a few creepy experiences on the job, but this one was the worst that I've ever had. Last year in April, when I was 17, I had every babysitter's nightmare happen to me. I met the family through my grandmother, Laura. Laura lives in a nicer neighbourhood. The people are genuinely nice and everyone knows each other. It was a very small subdivision, with a very big highway on one side of it and the woods on the other. One evening, my grandma introduced me to the family that lived across the street who was in need of a babysitter. They were a young couple with their first daughter, Lily. Lily was three years old at the time. After talking to them for a while, the family asked me if I could try babysitting Lily. I agreed. And after watching her a few times, the family asked me to stay on as their regular babysitter. Lily, like most three-year-olds, was a handful. But she was a sweet kid, so I agreed to help the parents out. We set up a schedule where I would come over twice a month regularly for their date nights. This was perfectly fine by me, and as a teen, this was a dream job. Because my grandma lived across the street, we developed a pattern. Every time I babysat, I would park my car at her house and chat to her before I went over to Lily. I would also stop in before I left. My grandma would leave the side door unlocked for me because she would fall asleep sometimes before I got done. A couple of years passed without incident. Lily turned four, then five, and became even more of a handful. The night of the incident, the parents left in the early afternoon, and because the sun was still out, Lily wanted to go to the park down the road. I said no initially, because I had no key to lock the door with, but she wore me down with her persistence. I turned a light on in the living room and led her out of the back door. We stayed at the park until it got dark, and I was exhausted by the time we got back to the house. When we got back, nothing looked out of place. I made Lily stay in the kitchen as I made a sweep around the house to check that everything was okay. The only place that I didn't check was the attic, as I was not allowed to go up there. After confirming to her that there weren't any bogeymen in the house, I cooked dinner for Lily. Afterwards, we played in the basement until it was almost bedtime. As the evening progressed, I would occasionally hear creaks and odd clanking noises from the floor above us, but I just brushed that off as the house being old. The family's cat, a very antisocial creature that hated noise, stood near the top of the steps the whole time that we were in the basement. The cat hissed occasionally at nothing. I consider that to be weirder than anything else. Finally, declaring it was bedtime, I let Lily climb onto my back and gave her a piggyback ride upstairs. The way her house was laid out, there was a long hallway in the middle. To the left was Lily's room. To the right, directly opposite Lily's room, was the parents' room. The parents' room had a door on the other side, connecting it to the front hall, meaning the front door. Lily was always proud of being a big girl and sleeping in her own room every night. Tonight though, she really missed her parents and wanted to sleep in their room. I didn't see this as a problem, it had happened before, and the parents didn't mind. I tucked Lily in 
and went back to the kitchen to read until her parents got home. The whole time I was in the kitchen, I kept hearing a strange crunching noise. It would last about a minute before stopping, and then a few minutes later would start up again, and the cycle would go on and on. I began walking around the house in search of the noise, when I heard Lily starting to cry. Lily normally falls asleep within five minutes, without much incident, so her crying was very unusual. I walked back to her parents' room and stood in the doorway facing her, her back to her room. The only light was a small lamp next to the bed that Lily had turned on. What's wrong, Lily? I asked, stepping closer. Uh, I keep hearing noises. I'm scared. I know, sweetie, but it's okay. I'm looking for them right now. Hey, do you want to come with me? It'll be like an adventure, I said excitedly, trying to cheer her up. I assumed that the noise was the cat playing with something, but I didn't want to leave Lily upset and alone. I figured that if I brought her, I could turn it into a game, which might help her feel better. I walked towards the bed, my back still to the door, and was about to swing her up into my arms to carry her, when she pointed behind me and said, Who's that? I whipped around to see someone big climbing out from underneath Lily's bed. There was something in his hand that glinted in the dim light. He was staring at us. I reached out and slammed the door shut as he lunged through the hallway with a yell. The door had a flimsy lock on it that I clicked into place seconds before the knob started rattling. Lily, understandably, was screaming her head off in panic. Suddenly, the door started shaking as the man began throwing himself at it. I couldn't afford to freeze. The man was at the door leading into the house. Praying that he was acting alone and there wouldn't be a partner hiding elsewhere, I snatched Lily into my arms and ran for the other door in the room that led to the front door. The door behind us kept shuddering. I threw open the bedroom door, knowing that I wouldn't have long to undo the two locks on the front door. The shuddering behind us stopped as the man heard us moving. He started screaming at us, running through the inside of the house going the long ways to the front door. I managed to undo the locks and sprinted across the street to my grandma's without looking back. We made it into the house through the unlocked side door, which I quickly locked behind me. Lily was still screaming, which scared my grandma awake. I handed Lily to her and ran through the house checking the locks. Once I was sure that everything was safe, I ran back to my grandma and told her that we needed to call the cops. My grandma gave me her phone. I went into the living room away from all the noise to make the call. On the phone, the operator I spoke to sent police immediately upon hearing what had happened. She then asked me if I could safely see the house. Carefully pulling aside the curtains, I chanced to peek through the window at the house across the street. The front door was shut, which was not how I'd left it, and all of the lights were off, when I always keep at least one light on. I mentioned this to her, and she told me to stay put. The police arrived in a few minutes and did a search of the area, but by that time the man was gone. They spoke to Lily and I, but we couldn't offer much because we didn't get a chance to see him. When the parents got home and saw the chaos, they were terrified and ran over to us. When I told them what happened, they seemed just as confused as we were. Whilst the police didn't find the man, they did find one thing that he left behind under Lily's bed. A box of mint Tic Tacs. The crunching noise that we heard was him chewing on them whilst he waited for Lily to go to bed. I don't know who you are or what your plan was to do, but let's never 
meet again. Number two. I began babysitting at 13 to earn extra money to spend on horribly embarrassing things like Fall Out Boy CDs. I would almost always work for my father's clients, he's a lawyer, and get referred by word of mouth. I was babysitting for one family who had a little girl of nine and a little boy of seven. The parents seemed okay, a tad crotchety, giving me a full schedule to follow and jokingly threatening to be any boy who might mysteriously show up after they left. It felt cruel for them to accuse me of even knowing a boy, given that I basically looked like an overgrown baby with frizzy hair at my age. Almost immediately after the parents leave, the little girl sings in a creepy high-pitched voice, We're all alone now. Righto, cue the Shining soundtrack. I know, the little boy chimed in. Let's play rape. Looking back now, I know the kid probably just heard that term on TV and knew the word was shocking and said it just for a reaction. I totally bought into it at the time, sputtering wide-eyed and changing the subject quickly. These kids were hell for the next hour. I wouldn't let them watch South Park on the TV because their parents did not seem to allow their precious nine and seven year olds to watch a show like that. As soon as I said no, the little girl said casually, oh, that's fine. We'll just go play PlayStation in the family room. Feel free to watch it out here. I knew exactly what was headed. I said to them that they could go watch any other TV show in the living room whilst I made them dinner. The parents had left instructions to make them sandwiches. I could handle that. Before I had even got the bread out, I hear a massive crash. It seems like the little girl had broken a glass. Tutting and pissed, but ultimately with no way of punishing her, I cleaned it up whilst the two incredibly weird kids watched with wide eyes. So I dumped the broken glass into the trash and went back to making the sandwiches. I'm a vegetarian, so whilst the children had chicken, I made a simple salad sandwich for myself. Just as I was finishing, the little boy screamed out in what sounded like a pantomime of pain. Nonetheless, I ran over to the couch in the living room to check on him. My ankle, he howled, dramatically flopping back into the couch. While I tried to figure out how he had hurt his ankle, the little girl slipped out of the room. Peripherally, I was aware of this, but didn't really pay it any mind and focused on the little boy pretending to be in pain. He kept saying, I went to stand, but it hurt too much. I don't know. Over and over, until his eyes suddenly flicked to just behind me, where I could see the little girl standing with a perturbing smile on her face. It was a miracle he was healed. At this point, I was just thinking these kids were very strange and craved attention a little too much and probably needed more parental involvement. But whatever, I was 13 and that $60 was only four hours away. I set out the sandwiches for the two to eat at the dining table and I went to get a soda and returned. After pouring soda for both of them, I realized that they hadn't taken a bite out of their sandwiches yet. I asked them what they were waiting for. They smiled. For you to take a bite out of yours. I am so glad I had a gut feeling to open my sandwich. Because when I did, I saw glass. Broken glass. The broken glass that I had put in the trash. I stared in horror at these two little children. Staring at me. Giving me maniacal grins. I lost it, shouting, Are you too serious? At the very least, you could have really injured my mouth. 
what's wrong with you? Instead of crying or apologizing, or pretending to be ashamed or confused, these two little kids began laughing. And not a childish laugh either. It was a low and threatening laugh. I'll never forget that noise. My immediate reaction was that these kids are too young to be laughing like that. I called my older sister who was 17 at the time, told her over the phone what happened and cried about it a little. She came and took over for me. We left the house with chills after the parents arrived. I never babysat for those two again. What I can't get past is the level of predetermination that went into sprinkling that broken glass into my sandwich and the total remorseless way that they responded to me being upset. They were unlike any two kids I've ever met before or since. Number three. This happened ages ago when I used to babysit. I was maybe 13 at the time, living in the countryside and was babysitting most of the children on my street, which was around 20 houses. This particular neighbour would love to go out on Wednesday, because there would always be this Latin dance class that was going on in a nearby bar. So I was used to babysitting for her and knew that she'd always come back very late. That specific night, the oldest of the three, was a little difficult and didn't want to go to sleep. I struggled putting him into bed and afterwards was quite tired. I studied my maths a little and around midnight decided to take a nap until the kid's mum came back. A few minutes after falling asleep, I hear someone frantically knocking on the door trying to open it. It was the neighbour with her two young children. It was winter and we easily had three feet of snow and temperatures outside that must have been around minus 21 degrees C or minus 5 Fahrenheit. The kids only had their pyjamas on and an unzipped jacket. She was wearing jeans, a wool shirt and winter boots. I could see genuine fear in her eyes as I struggled unlocking the door. I panicked and had her walk all the way around the house to the patio door. When she got in, she quickly told me to bring all the children downstairs and turn off all the lights and to not answer the door to anyone. The kids kept asking, Who is daddy going to kill? Who is daddy going to kill? And she kept muting and saying nothing was going to happen. And then she left. I woke all the kids up and brought them into the playroom in the basement and asked them to play silently. The oldest, who hadn't been asleep for very long, was asking what was going on and I kept telling him it was a special occasion where he could come and play late with his neighbour's friends. I calmed down the two other children, telling them that no one was going to die. But in my mind, my time had come. I could see myself being shot whilst trying to protect these children. I was trying to figure out how to stay alive, or at the very least how to keep them alive. I wasn't trying to be a hero, but I was trying to convince myself that if it came down to that, I would have to try and protect them. I called 911, but started shaking and crying so much I didn't know what to do. It was an answering machine asking if I wanted the cops or an ambulance or firefighters. I called my mum, quickly told her what was going on, and she called the cops and joined me. As she got in the driveway, the neighbour's husband was walking up the street with a huge axe. My mum got into the house, locked the door and cracked open a window, and asked what was going on whilst he approached the house. He asked her to come out and confront him, thinking it was his wife. My mother then explained to him that she was the babysitter's mother and came after getting a worried 13 year old's call. He then asked us to give him his wife, but we didn't know where she was. 
He argued a little with my mum, but she was so calm, it calmed him down. I still admire her for that night. After about 15 minutes of arguing, he walked back home carrying his axe, and a few seconds later, his wife knocked on the patio door behind the house and came in. She was crying and apologising to my mother for the whole situation. She thought her neighbour was home, not the babysitter. My mother asked me to go check on the kids while she was taking care of the wife. A few minutes later, two police cars arrived and they came in and spent time with the wife asking tons of questions. Then me and then my mother. In the meantime, the woman I was babysitting for arrived and they interviewed her as well. They asked me and my mother if we were ready to go to court if the woman pressed charges against her husband. But surprisingly, she never did. Turns out that she had just announced to her firefighter husband that she was sleeping with her boss in order to get a raise because they were struggling financially. He got his firefighting axe and said that he was going to kill the bastard. But she wanted to stop him. That's why she brought the kids and left. I was always scared of him after that, and whenever I saw his children, I would check if they had any signs of violence. But they moved around six months later, and we moved two years after. Number four. I grew up in a really safe city in the Midwest, in an even safer neighborhood sort of set back in the woods and separated from the main part of town. I haven't had a lot of creepy encounters in my short life, so this one is pretty much the most afraid I've ever been. I was 11 at the time, and had only just passed my CPR babysitting essential course at the REC. My neighbourhood was very close-knit, all of the kids on my street played together, and because of my two younger brothers, I would soon become the automatic babysitter for the three families we lived closest to. I looked after my brothers for short amounts of time, but this was my first real job as a babysitter. I watched these two grade school age kids who lived across the street. They were family friends, and the parents had promised that they would be home by 11pm and I knew that my parents were home and ready to step in if I needed anything. So I wasn't a little nervous, but felt like I had things under control. These kids were a novice babysitter's dream. They'd been trained that they were only allowed to choose one treat each before bed, and actually refused my offer to let them finish the show we were watching because it was their bedtime and they still needed to brush their teeth first. I was floored, but it made my job super easy. So I tucked them in and headed back downstairs to watch TV until their parents returned. The mother was an interior designer, so their house was spacious and absolutely beautiful. Their living room is at the back of the house with floor to ceiling windows and is a great view of the woods into their backyard. The couch is set up so it backs onto these windows, and I was watching TV with their elderly white Labrador, Alex. Suddenly though, out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw something large and light coloured brush past the window behind me. I thought it might just be a deer, but I was 11 and alone, and I have an active imagination. So I began to feel uneasy and pretty on edge. The parents weren't due back for another two hours, so I walked into the kitchen to call my mum and dad for reassurance. Alex followed. Their kitchen faces the living room, with the house phones on the counter, as this was before cell phones happened. Standing at the counter dialing my parents, I had a clear view through the broad archways into the living room, and out of those enormous windows into the backyard. Alex laid down at my feet, as I stood next to the counter 
and told my mum that I thought I'd seen something out the window. Hearing her voice was comforting and reassuring, as I thought it would be. So I told her that no, I didn't need dad to come over, and that yes, I'd call for her if I needed anything at all. I hung up the phone, and sat down on the floor to rub Alex's ears and belly for a few minutes. I was still kind of wary of the living room. I hadn't been there too long before I caught a glimpse of something odd outside those giant windows. I looked harder, past the glare of the TV, and noticed a tiny, bobbing light moving around the woods. Probably just a neighbour, I thought. But as I watched, the light seemed to be moving into what was undeniably my direction. My whole body froze, and I stared as the light as it got closer, and closer to the living room windows. And at some point I realised that, complete with paralysing horror, the light had grown large enough for the source to be right outside the house. The beam swung from one side of the living room to the other, and then settled directly on my face. I don't even think I squinted into the bright light that shone through the window into my eyes. I was startled. Alex snoozed, placid in his old age, and entirely unaware that my heart had pretty much stopped beating. The light moved again, this time swinging away to illuminate her face from underneath. I saw dark hollow eye sockets, and the glowing curves of someone's cheeks, but the facial details were lost into the harsh angle of the flashlight beam. At this point I was trying with all my might to scream, or to move my fingers enough to dial 911, or move out of my view of the window, literally anything would have been better than sitting there with my mouth open and tears in my eyes like a stuffed turkey. But I'd never felt this kind of icy terror before. I was completely immobilised by it. Everything felt like it was moving in slow motion and I was totally powerless. The light swung around to point at me, then quickly moved back underneath to the horrible face outside. It repeated this pattern once or twice more, and then suddenly disappeared. The flashlight had been turned off and for whatever reason that was finally enough to let me move again. I quickly stood there and hit dial, about to call 911, as I mentally debated whether to get up there to the master bedroom with the children, or just grab them and try and run out the front door to my parents' house. The rec class had not prepared me for this. Before I even got as far as the foyer and dialed the first one, I heard a loud boom and felt my gut leap into my throat as I realised I remembered to close the main garage doors that locked the door from the garage to the laundry room, but I couldn't remember locking the main doors from the garage to their backyard. I almost dropped the phone as someone began pounding on the interior door. Through the pounding though, I could hear a voice. A really, really familiar voice. Mavis? Mavis? It's dad. Let me in. I stumbled over completely numb and unlocked the door. My dad could hardly stand up. He was laughing so hard. Apparently my mum had sent him over anyway to check on me to make sure there was nothing to be afraid of. He had done a quick sweep of the woods in the backyard, with a flashlight under the assumption that mum had mentioned that he'd be coming over to me. He saw me through the window and attempted to show me it was him by pointing at me, and then shining the light on his face, under his freaking face. He was unaware that the shadows made it impossible for me to tell who he was, until he saw the colour drain from my face, and realised that he'd just given me the scare of my life. He thought it was pretty funny. I didn't really agree. I really thought I was about to get all kinds of murdered. But I'm so glad. It was a false alarm. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I think this just goes to show that most of the time, 
The horror lies in the experience of the babysitter, especially if the children are psychos. I mean, who puts glass in someone's sandwich? That's seriously messed up behaviour. Have any of you guys ever had any creepy or unpleasant babysitting experiences? Feel free to let me know in the comment section below, or you can send it over to my email for a chance to have it featured in a future video. If you enjoyed the video, please let me and everyone else know by smashing the like button and dropping a comment with your thoughts as it goes a long way. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at The Mortis Media for some secret stuff you won't find anywhere else. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.